You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. In the iconic Matrix scene, Neo confronts a choice. Shall he take the red pill or the blue one? This is a dilemma that transcends mere pills. It's a clash of two of the most popular ethical ideologies of our world. They form the battleground on which we fight most of our daily battles, both as individuals and as a society. Today, we will take a closer look at this labyrinth of decision making and explore how we can navigate it without falling prey to its treacherous pitfalls. Imagine a world where your choices impact not just your own happiness, but the well-being of an entire society. Now, envision another realm where moral duty is an unwavering compass, guiding actions regardless of their consequences. Welcome to the crossroads of Felicitas and Dionville, which represents the clash between utilitarianism and deontology. Ladies and gentlemen, you have expressed your interest in acquiring a plot of land in the fictitious city of Felicitas. Let me briefly introduce you this utopian city where utilitarian principles reign supreme. In Felicitas, every decision, law and social structure is meticulously crafted to maximize overall happiness and well-being for its citizens. The city's governing body, the Bureau of Maximum Happiness, operates on the principle of the greater good. All decisions, from urban planning to resource allocation, are based on their potential to enhance the overall happiness of the population. This means the government aims at producing the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people. Citizens are encouraged to contribute to society in ways that align with this greater good. In Felicitas, a cutting-edge technology known as the Happiness Index constantly monitors and evaluates the emotional well-being of every citizen. As every decision is based on happiness, this index is essential. Citizens wear devices that measure their mood, stress levels and overall satisfaction. This data is then aggravated to provide real-time insights in the city's collective happiness. In Felicitas, career choices are not merely personal preferences, but they are determined by a sophisticated algorithm. This algorithm takes into account individual skill, aptitudes and preferences aiming to ensure that each citizen contributes optimally to society while finding fulfillment in their work. If the estimated happiness you produce for society as a cook exceeds your personal happiness derived from being a zookeeper, then better get your knives ready. You'll be sent to the kitchen. Everything comes at a price. In return, basic human needs such as housing, healthcare and education are prioritized to maximize the well-being of the entire population. The city employs efficient systems to minimize waste and environmental impact, ensuring sustainability for future generations. So the majority will be well cared for, today, tomorrow and across centuries. If this city does not tickle your fancy, not to worry. We also have another offer in our portfolio. This city is quite the opposite of Felicitas, but just as suitable for investing your money. Welcome to the fictional city of Dionville where deontological principles form the bedrock of societal norms and values. In Dionville, the citizens adhere strictly to rules, duties and moral absolutes. So let me show you around this deontological society for a moment. In Dionville, there exists an exhaustive and meticulously detailed rulebook that serves as the ethical compass for every citizen. These rules are not open to interpretation and each one is considered an absolute moral duty. Citizens are expected to follow these rules regardless of the consequences, as deontological ethics prioritize the inherent rightness or wrongness of actions over their outcomes. Dionville's moral code comprises absolute imperatives such as do not lie, do not steal and do not harm others. These imperatives are regarded as universal moral truths and deviation from them is considered ethically unacceptable. This might seem a bit rigid. However, Dianville places a strong emphasis on individual rights and dignity. Society believes that protecting individual rights is a duty in itself, and citizens are therefore obligated to respect and safeguard the rights of others. To ensure this behavior, Dianville focuses on ethical training. From an early age, citizens of Dianville undergo rigorous ethical education to instill a deep understanding of their moral duties. The society emphasizes the importance of duty for its own sake, irrespective of the consequences. Citizens are expected to internalize these principles to the extent that they become second nature. Rights and responsibilities are arranged on the individual level here. 
Dionville acknowledges the principle of personal autonomy, but it is tempered by the requirement of informed consent. Citizens are expected to make choices that align with their moral duties, and decisions that deviate from these duties may be restricted. Each seems like an idyllic utopia in its own right. You might have a preference as to where you would like to build your house, but broadly speaking, both cities make livable places, right? Well, before we are quitting our jobs and move, let's leave this eager realtor behind and have a chat with a citizen who might also have come across some of the city's problems. While Felicitas may seem like a utopian paradise driven by utilitarian ideals, the implemented policies also raise some critical questions. In Felicitas, the overarching goal is the maximization of happiness. However, the question arises, whose happiness takes precedence? Utilitarianism often faces criticism for potentially sacrificing the well-being of a few for the greater happiness of the many. How does Felicitas address issues of injustice and inequality? Does the collective well-being of the majority outweigh the happiness of minority groups or individuals? Balancing the interests of different demographics becomes a delicate ethical question within a utilitarian society. As the happiness of the many is the aim, minority groups are in danger of being disregarded. One of the challenges in Felicitas lies in the quantification of happiness. How does the society measure and compare the happiness of different individuals or groups? Is there a standardized metric for happiness or does it rely on subjective assessments? Determining what contributes to genuine happiness becomes a complex task, and the extent to which taking happiness into account contributes to a good decision at all is becoming increasingly controversial among the population of Felicitas. Now let's shift back to Dionville. Here the citizens are also struggling, although their problems are quite different. In Dionville, where actions are judged based on adherence to moral rules or duties, a key question arises. Are there universal duties that apply to all individuals, regardless of cultural or contextual differences? How does the society prioritize one duty over another? What should we do when two maxims collide? Is it even possible to create a flawless rulebook that lives up to the complexities of human life? And how does the society determine and agree upon these fundamental moral principles? Deontological ethics places significant emphasis on the intentions behind actions. So the question is, how does the population of Dionville discern and evaluate the intentions of individuals? Is the moral worth of an action solely determined by the motive behind it? What about the consequences of one's action? Do they not matter at all? The problems of Felicitas and Dionville are just as ancient as they are topical in our lives today, because they fuel the eternal debate between utilitarianism and deontological ethics. So let's all get into the elevator and move up one level of abstraction. The ethical approach of Felicitas is called utilitarianism. This mode of thought is chiefly advocated by Jeremy Bentham, who describes the human condition as follows. Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. So Bentham singles out pain and pleasure as the defining characteristics of human life. Fair enough. Pleasure and pain are definitely no trivial aspects of life. Hardly anyone would denounce their importance. But this primacy makes utilitarianism a hedonistic concept. And here we have the first weakness. Only because one action makes us happy does not mean that it is a good action. Because you cannot derive an art from an is. Philosophers would call this a naturalistic fallacy. This becomes obvious when we revisit the matrix scene from the beginning. If you make this decision using utilitarian principles, you will swallow the blue pill, because it promises a harmonious illusion that ensures well-being, even if it means sacrificing a raw truth. The whole of humanity enslaved by machines and held within an illusion of bliss is not a dystopian scenario, but the best possible outcome, because it clearly produces the greatest amount of happiness for the largest number of people. Dostoevsky gets to the heart of this utilitarian dilemma in his novel The Brothers Karamazov. Imagine that you yourself are building the edifice of human destiny with the object of making people happy in the finale, of giving them peace and rest at last. But for that, you must inevitably and unavoidably torture just one tiny creature and raise your edifice on the foundation of her unrequited tears. Would you agree to be the architect on such conditions? And can you admit the idea that the people for whom you are building would agree to accept their happiness on the unjustified blood of a tortured child? 
and having accepted it, to remain forever happy? So Neo decides to swallow the red pill and thereby, arguably, camps among the deontologists. One of the most famous deontologists in history is Immanuel Kant. He came up with his idea of the categorical imperative. Act only according to that maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. This idea forms the bedrock of matters in Dionville. And this is also a reasonable approach to human action. All the principles we derive from this dictum seem to contribute to harmonious cooperation. Do not lie, tell the truth and be reliable sound like sensible guidelines. And it is the intent to act in accordance with these principles that counts. So even if the outcome of an action might seem bad, it is only the intention that matters. But in reality, things get more confusing. What if a lie serves good ends? As soon as we think of the lie that hides a potential victim from a murderer, we have arrived at the limits of deontological reasoning. Because none of these approaches can live up to the complexity of life, modern society employs both. So let's first look at some of the areas in which we make use of utilitarian ethics. Measures like vaccination programs and quarantine during pandemics prioritize the greater good over individual liberties, aiming to maximize overall well-being. Policies addressing climate change and pollution control often seek the greatest good for the largest number by emphasizing the well-being of future generations. Certain economic policies, like those focused on reducing poverty or unemployment, align with utilitarian principles by maximizing overall societal welfare. So, as we see, a utilitarian approach also works in the real world and therefore governs vast parts of our society today. But where does this approach fail? And are these areas better off with a deontological organization? Deontological principles underpin many human rights frameworks, where certain rights are considered inviolable and should be upheld regardless of potential positive outcomes. In cases where the protection of individual rights, such as freedom of speech, takes precedence over potential societal benefits, a deontological perspective is at play. Informed consent and patient autonomy in medical decisions reflect deontological principles, prioritizing individual rights even when it might conflict with potential overall benefits. So what do you think about these two modes of decision making? And in which areas of society would you rather switch to a different paradigm? In this context, freedom of speech is a particularly interesting issue. It used to sit quite firmly within the camp of deontological reasoning, which emphasized this freedom almost without considering the consequences of certain utterances. Nowadays, this is starting to shift. If certain statements are seen as particularly corrosive to society, there's an increasing demand for sanctions. Does this utilitarian shift embody a good and necessary development, or is it a step in the wrong direction? Write your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, if you like this content, feel free to leave a subscription. Thanks for watching.